Uh, I don't wonder, if, are you a mathematician? Uh, the quote comes from a conversation between uh, Isaac Asimov and, and Martin Gardner. And uh, the story is that Isaac Asimov walked up to Martin Gardner and said, are you a mathematician? And Martin Gardner said, no. Are you a biologist, a biochemist or whatever? He said, no. And then Isaac Asimov volunteered, we're in the same racket. We take what everybody else does and we rewrite it for, the, for everybody else to understand. So, so that was the idea. So the real question is, is Martin Gardner a mathematician? All right. Now, uh, some myths or misunderstandings or exaggerations, however you want to think about it. One is that he took no math after high school. And just as a point, he, I have a copy of his college transcript, and he certainly did take mathematics. Um, he just doesn't seem to remember it. He was enamored with philosophy and, 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 and so on. Uh, he did not appreciate math until he started working for Scientific American in 1937. Okay, uh, and he said many things like that, like he, when he got the, got the job, he ran out and bought a bunch of textbooks and so forth. But the tr truth is he had been quoting for years from math texts, uh, you know, back to like 1935, but he just didn't own any of these books because he was poor. And his interest in recreational math dates from the same time, and this is not true. And for example, in the late 40s, he um, was a regular attending member of Jacuthiel Ginsburg's uh, Scripta Mathematica recreational math seminars. So he, um, these are slight exaggerations, but the question is, he was not a mathematician. Now, is that also a myth? Well, that's the purpose for this talk. He never claimed to be a mathematician. He would never claim to be a mathematician. He would always describe himself as a journalist, always. And, and he always would emphasize, of course, that his job, like Isaac Asimov had said, was to describe the work of others and popularize it and bring it to a larger audience to inspire people, however you want to phrase it. But what I'd like to say in this talk, and not contradicting those things, which are, of course, largely true, is that he did get his hands dirty working on mathematics to the extent possible. And he did it, as he would often say, by only struggling with the mathematics and learning it did he actually master explaining it to people. Okay, if it was easy for him, it wouldn't be so well explained. But if he knows what the difficulties were, he could explain it much better. But the other thing I say right here is that it's, in doing this over the years, he developed what I would call the delicate sense of what is interesting math to mathematicians. Okay, which is not something you get simply by repeating what others say. MAA, for example, uh, published 13 of his books. He, and 35 articles by him, approximately. Now, this particular cover was sent to me by him. Uh, if you can read in the top there in his handwriting, it says, I can almost read it over here easier. Dana, I made the cover, Martin. So, he was pretty excited about making the cover of MAA Horizons. All right. Another example uh, is this. Uh, article, a set of articles uh, inspired by him and entitled More Martin Gardner Mathematics. Okay, and so he was, when he wasn't writing, of course, he was a, um, a magnet for this kind of material. Early signs. He was very strong in high school math, even though he had negative things to say about his math teachers, because he wanted to be a physicist. When he went to college, that was his goal, to become a physics major. He was also interested in puzzles at a very early age and how they worked. It's well known, for example, his father gave him a copy of Sam Lloyd's Cyclopedia. Uh, an un a relatively unknown example is this letter to Cryptogram in 1932 when he was still in high school. Uh, basically says that um, we need to have 
better articles. You know, I don't want to solve cryptograms. I want to know how they're solved. I want to know the methods for solving them. And only in this way can we um, advance the field, okay? And it was a, so we basically wanted it to be an educational um, journal, cryptogram, instead of what it was, which was a collection of cryptograms. 1934, okay? Now remember, he was born in 1914, so you got, you got to get the ages here. Um, in 1934, he wrote this article for Hobbies Magazine, in which, this is a full page article, in which he describes his abiding interest in puzzles. All right, how he collected puzzles, and he had vir virtually every puzzle you could buy, which is actually true. His father was fairly rich, and he did actually have every puzzle you could buy because um, he had all the catalogs from Europe and all those other places. And he was really, really much into this. Now, he started posing problems for others uh, to solve, and this was as early as 1947 in some magic periodicals and some puzzle columns that he was writing at that time. All right? And he later adopted some a more mathemat mathematician's view of how to pose puzzles, and he offered prize puzzles. For example, oh no, I'm sorry, this is, an ex this, this is sort of an out of order slide, I apologize. This was something from 1941 in the Chicago Tribune, and this is one of these things where they interview people on the street, and they said, we talked to Martin Gardner and he gave us this problem, uh, which apparently is um, going, this, going around the University of Chicago campus. And this is a problem you've all seen before, okay? It starts off with, you are the elevator operator, and people get on and off the elevator, and it ends by asking, what's the name of the elevator operator? Uh, and uh, so, but in any event, so he, he's, in, he's in print promoting this. I don't know whether he invented it or not. Okay, this is a, an early example of him posing a problem. You know, he, uh, he was writing to Recreational Mathematics Magazine and said, here's something that I think you all should wor work on. Um, American Mathematical Monthly, um, the dissection problem. Uh, I think this looks like, what, College Math Journal? Mathematics. Mathematics Magazine. Okay, so again, he giving some combinatorial problems. They're, sounding, they're being posed more and more like by mathematicians. Now, of course, if he's posing the problem, it's not because somebody else gave it to him. If somebody else gave it to him, he would say somebody else gave it to him. Uh, jumping peg problems. Now this one is a little unusual in the sense that the, um, the solution is by the proposer. Okay, we all know peg solitaire problems. There's whole books written on this subject, uh, but this is an, uh, his contribution to that area. And again, I'm, emphasis is his contribution. Uh, cornering the king. This is a simple game of king and a queen on the board trying to avoid capture. And again, he poses the problem. This is an REC. Um, another one, uh, arrange things so that you optimize differences. Again, you recognize the style of puzzle, and you have to, again, recognize that he is inventing these puzzles because he's playing with all of these ideas all the time. You understand, he took about two weeks of every month to work on his column. It's not like he pounded them out in a day or two. He got into the problems. He Pose things because they were emergent from the work he was doing. Uh, a magic uh, three by three square where you have to make a uh, three by three square of square numbers. This, of course, is in the uh, wheelhouse of Lee Sallows, and, and he had worked with Lee Sallows on this kind of problem. I don't know much about this except for the title grabbed my attention. Um, if you know about any other problems that fall into this category, I'd appreciate being told. Of course, I do not know what Glasnick Mathematica is. Does anybody know? Ever heard of it? Who knows? Now, this one is kind of interesting. It's a, it's a really simple matchstick puzzle. But on more than one occasion, Martin Gardner would tell me that he invented this puzzle and he was very proud of it. Okay, so. So, at least since he repeated himself, I guess I should emphasize that uh, this one is you have a little martini glass and you have an olive inside it and you would need to move two matches so that the martini glass 
doesn't have the olive inside of it. It's easy with three matches, not so easy with two matches, etc. Okay, hopefully you've all seen this puzzle before. He did another matchstick puzzle, which appeared in um, Ask, the Ask Maryland column, where you take the, a number 100 and you move, what? Um, I've forgotten now. Two matches. You move two matches, and you and you and you create a cat. And uh, again, if you don't know the puzzle, you feel free to uh, work on it. Now he did create and market games. Now, if you don't have these, you should make sure you get them all in your collection. Hexapon, which was a um, uh, machine learning game in the sense that uh, it, before that term existed, it was a way to, um, uh, it was an instruction book. It came sort of in a big flat container that you could learn, the game would learn how to play the game and, and, and always win. Uh, then. Caden Industries published two of his games. Uh, Visual Brainstorms uh, has put out a book of games. Visual Drain Brainstorms 2 has a, acknowledges him, even though Visual Brainstorms 1 stole from him quite a bit. And there's a very curious uh, Scientific American box of puzzles that he seemed to know nothing about, which were all of his puzzles. Um, a co-authored article in Games Magazine. Now, so how did he get these problems? Again, this seems like an out of position slide. Basically, it's what I've already said. When he was working on a column, he would then uh, find properties, unmentioned things by other people, continue to work on them until he had enough to mention in print. And if he couldn't get it mentioned in print, he would just write a letter to somebody and ask them to solve the problem. His, course, his correspondence was enormous. Uh, this is an, an kind of a throwaway magic square for the new year. Uh, this is a one that I can't prove that he invented. I am certain that he got it from somebody. But basically, by running a matchstick around the inside of a polygon like this and counting the total number of turns it takes for the matchstick to make the tour, you can calculate the, the sum of these angles. And, and you get a nice little theorem in a constructive way. Um, he was a very big chess fan his entire life. And so it's not surprising that he has a lot of chess problems. And there was a 20 or 30 problems in his columns over the years. But this is ones we did later in life after the column was done. And so these were non-attacking queen problems that he had come up with. I believe this is probably, anybody want to guess what magazine this was from? Horizons, maybe? Um, in Horizons, he had this column called Gatherings for Gardeners, uh, excuse me, Ga Gardeners Gatherings. Um, and uh, this is another non-attacking column that he wrote with his own results in it, asking for solutions. Uh, something in rec recreational mathematics. Um, uh, some tiling issues, uh, calculator tricks in REC newsletter. Again, these weren't taken from other people. Another New Year's Eve curiosity. Now, I, I like this one. It was, um, the quote is what I think is the most interesting part. It says, while I thought I had a simple impossibility proof for all the linear tiles, it was quickly and independently shot down by Fan Chung and Herbert Taylor. Now, the fact that he was wrong is not the important thing. The important thing is he was trying to prove all of these things. Okay? He wasn't just copying other people's proofs. Now, several people have mentioned his interest in logic, and so this is an area he actually made some contributions to. His um, book, uh, based on a Scientific American article from 1952, Logic Machines and Diagrams, has gone through several editions. And he wrote to somebody in 1992 saying basically that what he had put in this book he thought would be a good educational technique, and he's a little bit surprised that it hasn't come up very much. So he was very proud of this result. And what I mean by this result, the whole chapter in the book is his own technique for diagramming 
solving logic puzzles by diagramming them in a certain way. So in 1951, I set myself the pleasant task of trying to work out such a system and so forth. So he, um, now of course he had re researched all the other logic diagramming stuff that had come before, and, but he has his own contribution to it. I am not going to go through this example, but you can see um, it involves starting with a normal um, set of premises like Lewis Carroll would work on, of course. This is very similar to the Lewis Carroll logic problems. And um, making it a little bit more symbolic and then um, a little more, even more symbolic and then representing it by uh, vertical lines for the um, uh, variables and horizontal lines for the premises and paths through the diagram would correspond to uh, contradictions or not con non-contradictions. Now, works well with others. Martin Gardner has, was very rarely a co-author, had very rarely, try one time, very rarely had a co-author, okay? 99% uh, easily of his works are singly authored. But with mathematics, he tended to have more co-authors, perhaps because well, the reasons that you could probably piece together for yourself. Now, when he co-authored an article on mathematics, uh, he would occasionally prove a theorem for them, but, but mainly he was involved in moving the problem forward, saying people would say, I don't know about this, and he'd come up with examples and say, no, this is what we need to be working on, and so forth. He wasn't necessarily um, solving all the problems, but he was very active and in the loop, keeping the problem and the solution going forward. All right. Now here's an early co-authored article that was an outgrowth of his work in the logic book. Um, Frank Harari, as most of you probably know, or many of you might know, is, is, is known for leaping on and co-authoring with everybody in sight. Um, and so, so he, he had his own take on Martin Gardner's way of diagramming. At which point, he wrote to me, he says, this gives me an Erdős number of two. And so, all right. Now, he got an Erdős number of two later, but, but this was his first Erdős number of two. Uh, here's an article he wrote uh, with Andy Liu. Article that he wrote with Fan Chung and uh, Ron Graham, who were discussed yesterday. In fact, this particular article was mentioned yesterday. It's on Steiner Trees. Um, and so, um, I actually have, well, it doesn't, if I went off topic, I would tell you I wrote a book about Steiner trees, but let's not do that. All right, here's a earlier work with uh, tiling that he got in touch with Lee Sallows, who's very good at this sort of thing, and started doing more work with these tilings with these um, rectilinear figures. And this led to um, this ar ar article on serial isograms with Lee Sallows and Guy and Knuth. Now, if you don't know it, a serial isogram is one in which the sides are of length one, two, three, four, and so on, and, and they tile the plane and they have interesting properties. And as he was writing that article, um, this is an example of an art, a letter to Knuth, in which he said, I'm glad, glad you liked my coloring proof of that mod eight result. Believe it or not, it occurred to me while I was typing up the first draft, I'd early sought solving it one way, and then I decided that, you know, 90 degree symmetry would, would give me the proof, et cetera. So again, just evidence that he was in the proof process with these articles. He wasn't just an onlooker or an honorary co-author. So I'm guessing many of you aren't aware of this book, which you should be. Um, the very famous text, um, by Sylvanius Thompson, which Gardner used to learn calculus when he was in high school, um, has long gone out of print and has long gone out of favor, okay? Because it, it's based on, uh, not based on limits, but it's based on infinitesimals. And so Gardner actually got this book back in print. He wrote about six or seven chapters to add to this book to explain uh, this to the modern audience and so forth. So this is, again, all of his own writing about this approach to calculus using infinitesimals. And he would also write about the philosophy of math. And we know, of course, that his only uh, degree was in the philosophy of science. 
Uh, and, uh, and of course, he necessarily had an interest in the philosophy of math, and he would write about that on, on many occasions. Let me finish with this quote from an introduction he wrote to a book. What are the properties of a mathematician? If a ma non-mathematician enters a social gathering with 100 professionals and is told 20 of them are mathematicians, can you tell? Well, his conclusion is you can talk to them, and as long as you don't talk about mathematics, mathematicians are just like the rest, rest of us. And, uh, and so this gets back to the original question, are you a mathematician? Uh, and, and I would contend, yes, he was a mathematician. He would never, never say that to anybody, but, but, but he walked the walk, he did the work, he promoted mathematics in a way that um, very few mathematicians have been able to do as well. So I think it would be a little um, ungrateful to say that he wasn't a mathematician. We just have to recognize his role in mathematics. Thank you. This may be hard to answer, but I'm hoping for a surprising answer. Um, all of the uh, stuff that Martin published over the decades and everything, um, did he work with anyone in particular on the technical drawings or illustrations, or was it always in-house like Scientific, Scientific American or some other magazine? Peter Renz, um, who's been in the last 15, 20 years very much involved with getting the art from Scientific American, he, he can tell you the name of all the artists, and they all worked for Scientific American. And as a result, it's sometimes hard to get the art because Scientific American, in their, their infinite wisdom, doesn't want to give it away. But, but yes, he, uh, he would do the diagrams, he would communicate to the artists, but the artists were in the employ of Scientific American. Okay, thank you. That, that might make a, an interesting talk if we could get well, that person to. He, it would, uh, yeah. the, the go-to expert is Peter Renz. All right. Well, let me take the last few seconds to interject a personal request. I've noticed that there are no copies left of the 2021 calendar. I'm guessing some of you don't think you need it. I don't have a copy, so. If you want to get rid of a 2021 calendar, I'm your man. All right, thank you. Is there, is there time for one more question? Well, sure, one more question. So relaying, uh, relaying an online question by Tom Ro uh, Roby. Uh, I thought you said earlier that he couldn't afford the math textbook he uh, quoted early in his career. But then later you indicated that his father was wealthy so he could buy all the puzzles he wanted. Question mark. How much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> he was very wealthy. His father was very wealthy. And, and when he went to college and he lived in Chicago, he would s spend the nights walking the streets, getting to know all of the people who were very impoverished during the Depression. So the Depression and Chicago life made a big impression on him, and he, led a he chose to live a very austere life. Okay, he, his father could pay for everything, but he lived in the, the most simplistic rooms you could possibly rent, and he had no money, he had no, no clothes, he had like a, a, a orange crate for a desk and a typewriter and an alarm clock, and that was all of his possessions. So he chose to live that way. And uh, it was only in the mid-50s, after he's had steady employment with the Parents Institute, that he started to have enough money to raise a family. But, but there's no contradiction there. It's just um, a matter of, of choice. OK?